The discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls represents one of the greatest archaeological discoveries of all time. The scrolls represent over 950 literary works, in addition to thousand more separate fragments. Of course, this represents a wide range of genres, including texts that will go on to comprise what we now call the Hebrew Bible or the Christian Old Testament, texts that were clearly authoritative in the community that composed them, although they never became canonical in the Jewish or Christian religions, along with a host of community-specific texts that outline the mores, laws, and social codes of the community that produced them. It is likely that the collective that produced these texts were the people that Josephus refers to as the Essenes, although it's conspicuous that the word Essene never occurs in any of the over 950 works recovered so far. The text referred to the people that produced this literature as the Yachad, or simply the community. Because the community seems to have preferred this term Yachad, that's going to be the word that I'll use to describe them as well. From what little we can tell, the Yachad seems to have emerged in a political religious break with the Jerusalemite temple administrators. In their literature, they describe this as a dispute between the so-called teacher of righteousness, which seems to be in the founder of the Yachad itself, with the so-called, quote, wicked priest, although we're not quite sure exactly who this refers to in history. It seems, therefore, that the Yachad emerges primarily in the aftermath of this break, although the exact details remain very sketchy. The community itself seems to have been quasi-monastic and required a relatively high degree of initiation to join. Further, it seems that they had a very high regard for ritual purity and belonged to a strain of Jewish apocalyptic theology. Clearly, religious literature and literacy were important to them, and this community seems to have existed for hundreds of years, for at least some time, at the site at Qumran. They do not seem to have survived the Great Revolt of 66 to 70 of the Common Era. It appears that they stored their literature in the caves near their site and went off to fight the Romans, if we are to trust Josephus. We are told by the Roman Jewish historian Josephus that they did have a strategos, or a general, who fell at the Battle of Ascalon. We are also told of the great bravery of the Essenes under Roman torture, though perhaps this is a literary device linking the Essenes with the Stoics for Josephus's Roman audience. Nevertheless, it does seem that the Yachad stored their scrolls in the caves and never returned. And there they sat as centuries and millennia began to pile up. Though it is possible that the scrolls were rediscovered, at least in part, from time to time through history. Interestingly enough, some scrolls were reported to have been found near Jericho in the early 3rd century, and we're told that Origen may have in fact used one of these scrolls in the production of his own critical edition of the Hebrew Bible. And further still, in a letter from the early 9th century, Timotheus, the patriarch of Seleucia, also mentions that certain scrolls were found in caves near Jericho. Though, just what these scrolls were, and what happened to them, has been lost to history. In this episode of Esoterica, I want to explore some of the more obscure and arcane texts of the Dead Sea Scrolls. From enciphered calendars, to astrological texts, to divination by thunder, the Dead Sea Scrolls still have mysteries to reveal. I'm Dr. Justin Sledge, and welcome to Esoterica, where we explore the arcane side of history, philosophy, and religion. The Yachad, or the community that produced the Dead Sea Scrolls, came into existence during the religious ferment that produced both Rabbinic Judaism and Christianity. Given this, it's not surprising that our basic religious and historical terms for analyzing both the scrolls and the community that produced them often fail to perfectly fit. Thus, much of what we can say about the scrolls and the community that produced them remains, and probably will reign, provisional. So, to be clear, I just want to acknowledge that I'm not an expert in the Dead Sea Scrolls, though, in this episode, I'm going to provide the best scholarly consensus that I can. And if I do venture to conjecture with my own ideas, I just want you to know, you can take them with a grain of salt. The texts recovered from the 11 caves around the site of Qumran represent nearly a thousand works of literature, and are preserved in varying degrees, from intact texts like the Great Isaiah Scroll, to merely fragments reassembled by scholars. Of course, this isn't to mention the tens of thousands of tiny fragments, sometimes with only single letters or no letters at all. The great majority of the texts recovered represent literature that we would now recognize as part of the Hebrew Bible or the Christian Old Testament. 
Though I think it's very important that we don't impose any categories like the Bible or a canon upon the Yachad. These texts were produced hundreds of years before even a concept emerged. And indeed, even the texts that have been recovered that we would now recognize as quote, biblical, vary significantly from the Masoretic texts that we now use to frame our modern Hebrew Bibles. So what we see, even in the so-called biblical texts from the Dead Sea Scrolls, is a great deal of fluidity about how these texts were composed in the ancient world. Further, a great many authoritative or scriptural texts that were important to this community have also emerged. And this would especially include texts like the Book of Enoch and the Book of Jubilees, which were very clearly important to this community. This is in addition to a great many other texts, especially hymns or psalms that have been recovered in addition. We may in fact get some clue about what texts were important to this community by looking at the distribution of the texts that have been recovered. For instance, 25 copies of the Book of Enoch along with 21 copies of the Book of Jubilees have been recovered. This should be compared to the 24 copies of the Book of Genesis, 18 copies of the Book of Exodus, 17 copies of the Book of Leviticus, and only 11 copies of the Book of Numbers. It's also worth noting that 22 copies of the Book of Isaiah have been recovered. Though we may say that Deuteronomy with 33 copies and Psalms with 39 copies represent the most favorite. So it's to be noted here that in some sense, even the centrality of the Torah, the five books of Moses, can't be taken for granted when analyzing what was important to this community. And it may be worth noting, there's a similar distribution to be found in the New Testament, especially with regards to the prophet Isaiah and the Psalms. Though not with the book of Jubilees, nor with the book of Enoch although the Book of Enoch is quoted once in the New Testament Book of Jude. We'll come back to the Book of Enoch and the Book of Jubilees in just a moment. As I mentioned before, the Yachad seemed to have had a very strong emphasis on ritual purity, and it was governed by a complex set of social rules and initiation processes. It seems that they saw themselves as a kind of righteous remnant, the sole group of Jews properly conducting themselves according to the laws of their God and that despite their persecuted status, they would emerge victorious after a cataclysmic battle between good and evil, between the sons of light and the warriors of Belial. Like many apocalyptic movements, it was them versus the world, including the supernatural world of demons. And it is to one of the idiosyncrasies of their communities that I want to focus on first, specifically how they deal with one of the most important religious concepts, the passage of time. Judaism, as you probably know, is a religion indexed by a series of yearly festivals, which generally speaking track to the ancient Israelite agricultural cycle. But as one attempts to observe these festivals, there's quickly a religious and astronomical problem. The calendrical system described in the Hebrew Bible is a lunar calendar, and insofar as those festivals are tied to a specific lunar date, they begin to migrate through the seasons vis-a-vis -vis the solar calendar. The harvest festival of Sukkot, for instance, would first begin to happen in its proper time, in the autumn. But as the years wore on, and as the festival continued to be observed, it would slowly creep further and further and further through the seasons. Beginning in the autumn, several years later it would be in the winter, and then several years after that it would be in the spring, the exact opposite of a harvest festival, before finally turning through the summer and returning back into the fall about 30-something years later. This exact phenomena can be observed in the Islamic festival of Ramadan, which over the course of about 30 years marches through every single season. Rabbinical Judaism recognized this creeping of the festivals as a significant problem and developed a solution to it. Every 36 months, the rabbis introduced a leap month, second Adar, in order to prevent the festivals creeping through the seasons. Thus, while the festivals do oscillate vis-a-vis -vis the Gregorian or solar calendar, and this is why sometimes you'll hear Jewish people refer to as the high holidays coming earlier or later, this does prevent the festivals from leaving their specific seasonal context. Of course, this didn't completely settle debates within the Jewish calendar, even by the 10th century, the Saudi Agawan and the Exilarch are mutually excommunicating each other over precisely debates about how to count the calendar cycle. Though, what's crucial to understand about these calendrical debates in Judaism is that the festivals are divinely mandated and absolutely must be celebrated on very specific days. Thus, if you mistake the day, that is in some sense a religious catastrophe. If the Israelite God commands the Jewish people to fast or to bring an offering on a certain day, they are religiously obligated to do that on that day. And therefore the calendar isn't just about keeping time, it's about following the exact letter of the law of God. So debates about the calendar are not merely academic or even astronomical. They're theological. Despite the rabbinical solution of introducing a leap month every 36 months, there was, during the Second Temple period, another viable option, a completely solar calendar. 
This completely solar calendar was described both in the Book of Jubilees and in the Book of Enoch, and it appears the Yachad adopted it. In this calendar, there are exactly 12 months of 30 days, along with four, quote, remembrance days, which link the four seasons together, thus producing a calendar of exactly 364 days. What is perhaps most interesting about the possibility that the Yachad adopted this Enochian or solar calendar is that they would have been celebrating the divinely mandated festivals on different days than virtually all the Jewish community. Though this calendar isn't perfect either. Note that it's only 364 days, whereas a perfect solar calendar needs to be about 365 and a fourth days. Thus, over the hundreds of years of the Yachad would have existed, the calendar itself would have also come out of sync with the seasons. Just how they would have corrected for this, assuming they ever did adopt this calendar, in fact, remains a mystery. And it is precisely this calendrical debate that brings us to some of our first esoteric Dead Sea Scrolls. It seems that for the Yachad, both calendrical and sectarian topics were not only enough to write down and differ with virtually all the rest of the Jewish world, but it also appears they decided to encode some of these texts for reasons that aren't terribly clear. About 1% of the Dead Sea Scrolls are written in groups of substitution ciphers that scholars now call Cryptic A, Cryptic B, and, well, Cryptic C. About 50 texts written in Cryptic A have been recovered and deciphered. Oddly enough, the vast majority of these are written on papyrus rather than on parchment. Not only is Cryptic A a substitution cipher, it also seems like the scribes further attempted to obscure their meaning by doing things like inverting the text on the page. This can be seen, for instance, in the fragment 4Q324D. Only one text has been discovered so far in Cryptic C, 4Q363A. Cryptic C seems to be primarily made up of Paleo-Hebrew letters with the addition of five rather mysterious other letters. The text encoded in Cryptic C seems to have been legal in nature, although it is in a bad state of preservation. Cryptic B seems to be made up of 22 or 23 characters, although it remains undeciphered. And there are only two texts written in Cryptic B, both on parchment. Interestingly enough, it appears that a conspicuous amount of Cryptic A text are concerned with both calendrical and astrological matters. For instance, 4Q317 is written in Cryptic A and is concerned with the cycles of the moon. Specifically, it seems to divide the phases of the moon into 1 14th segments for the use in the solar calendar of the Yachad. Why exactly the author or the scribe decided to encode this text in Cryptic A remains mysterious. Further, a series of fragments, 4Q186, 4Q534, and 4Q561, all seem to combine together to form a kind of astrological horoscope manual, likely one of the earliest ever recovered in the Jewish world. Curiously enough, 4Q186 is not only written in a polyalphabetic substitution cipher, and is written left to right, unlike usual Hebrew, of course, which is written right to left. These texts seem to argue that one's physical appearance are in some sense determined by the astrological conditions at one's birth. In this rather fragmentary and encoded manuscript, we do have a mention of the sign of Taurus and the use of what it seems to be houses, or as the text refer to them, as columns. Further, it also seems that this astrological theory divides things into houses of darkness and houses of light for determining the physical features of those born at those specific astrological junctures. And of course, scholarship goes on. As recently as 2018, scholars were able to piece together an entirely new pre c calendar written in Cryptic A. From these fragmentary and encoded texts, it seems that the Yachad had an interest in astrology, which, given their further interest in the Book of Enoch, isn't terribly surprising. Though, as you may know, the relationship between Judaism and astrology has proved divisive over the centuries. It's rather clear that ancient Judaism knew of astrology and practiced it. We have evidence here from both the Dead Sea Scrolls, but also from the beautiful mosaic floor of the Zodiac found at the Beit Alpha Synagogue dating to the 6th century. Of course, astrology has long also had opponents within Judaism. There is the argument found in the Babylonian Talmud that, quote, ain mazal by Yisrael. That is to say that there is no mazal, or astrological influence, to be found on Israel. This argument seems to hinge on the idea that the unique covenant that Israel has with its God precludes the possibility of astrological influence, given the idea that the Israelite God has a direct providential relationship with Israel. Of course, this doesn't preclude the idea that mazal, or astrological influence, may affect other nations, or in fact, individual members of the Israelite community. The relationship between Judaism, Kabbalah, and astrology is long and complicated, 
and you guessed it, will be the subject of a future episode of Esoterica, so stay tuned. Another fragmentary, though not encoded text found among the Dead Sea Scrolls, also seems to reveal a form of divination recognized by the Yachad. 4Q318 describes the transit of the moon through the zodiac, and includes, at the very end, a small brontological section. A brontologian is a divinatory almanac, whereby the sound of thunder at various times is indicative of future events. You may recognize the word from the dinosaur Brontosaurus, or the thunder lizard. In the Dead Sea Scroll fragment, we're told here of thunder indicating various kinds of future woes and misfortunes befalling the Jewish people, because the future always holds woes and misfortunes for the Jewish people. There are other texts that are encoded, specifically those that are described as being sectarian. These are the ones specific to the mores and legal codes of the Yachad itself. An interesting example of an encoded sectarian text is 4Q298, or the words of the Maskil to the Sons of Dawn, the Sons of Dawn here referring to members of the Yachad. The title or the beginning of this text is written in standard square Hebrew, but the rest of the text, for whatever reason, is written in cryptic A. This is likely to keep the esoteric sectarian knowledge of the Yachad from the non-initiate. Many other texts written in cryptic A, and I mentioned there are about 50 of these, seem to be documents internal to the community itself. And it seems that these were composed by community elites, probably to keep them out of the prying eyes of non-initiates. It's also worth noting that in June of 2009, a stone cup was excavated in Jerusalem. This stone cup also bore an inscription similar to the cryptic text found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. This script is sometimes referred to as Hieratic Hebrew. And it's believed that the stone cup was meant to be used by the Jerusalemite priesthood. One learned line of speculation is that this esoteric Hebrew script was used exclusively by the Jerusalemite priests. Recall that the Yachad itself was founded, perhaps, by dissident Jerusalemite priests, but the jury's still out on all of this. Of course, I couldn't do this episode without mentioning what is to me the most tantalizingly obscure text ever found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Copper Scroll. This scroll, made in copper and inscribed by punching the letters into one side, was found at Cave 3, the furthest cave from the Qumran site. Despite being found in 1952, it wasn't until 1956 that the very fragile scroll was first cut into longitudinal scripts and then finally read. What it revealed was nothing short than a f***ing treasure map. Like booty traps, do the truffle shuffle, Dead Sea Scroll, Goonies, treasure map. The scroll details, of course cryptically, the location of 64 different treasures. The scroll details the location of 64 different caches of gold, silver, and priestly artifacts, including, apparently, another copy of the scroll itself. If you combine all of the gold and silver described in the scroll, it comes out to be about 65 tons of silver and about 26 tons of gold. The scroll itself is written in a dialect of Hebrew very similar to Mishnaic, or Rabbinical Hebrew, although Greek letters do appear in the scroll for reasons that are, well, you guessed it, completely obscure. In the scholarship, there's serious doubt about whether the treasure was ever real, or where it came from if it were real. Theories range from the temple treasury in Jerusalem being secreted away before the Roman destruction, all the way to the pool of resources of the Yachad itself. Of course, one would wonder, why go through all the effort of punching out a scroll on copper of all things if this treasure were never real in the first place? At this point, none of the treasure has ever been publicly discovered. Although it is possible that some artifacts recovered from the Bar Kokhba period at Nachal Hever are actually described by the scroll, though this is seriously disputed. So, if after watching this episode and you're hiking around in the Judean wilderness and you find 15 talents of gold hidden in a cave or something, holler at you, boy. So, the Dead Sea Scrolls. Scriptures, sectarian texts, astrological manuals, Enochian calendars, encoded texts, and of course, a freaking treasure map. If you're interested in the esoteric dimensions of ancient texts, for instance the history of magic or occult philosophies, make sure to subscribe to Esoterica. We also would really hope you would consider supporting our work on Patreon or with a one-time donation. Your support really does help to make Esoterica possible. The academic, and unfortunately also, the fringe literature on the Dead Sea Scrolls is enormous, and I'm not going to pretend to give an exhaustive bibliography of text here today. However, I would like to make a couple of recommendations of books that I find to be accessible, scholarly, and insightful. For a brief, reliable introduction to the Dead Sea Scrolls, I would take a look at Collins's The Dead Sea Scrolls, a biography. It's relatively easy to read and a solid scholarly introduction to the texts themselves. 
The most accessible gathering of the non-biblical Dead Sea Scrolls is the Complete Dead Sea Scrolls in English by Vermis. This inexpensive volume is published by Penguin and contains a wide range of scrolls, including all those mentioned in this episode today. Indeed, I will consult the bibliographic material in this text to continue your research into the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's invaluable. I also really enjoy the Oxford Handbook of the Dead Sea Scrolls. This relatively inexpensive volume provides a range of studies on various subjects in Dead Sea Scrolls studies. And the range of articles in this substantial volume are excellent scholarship, and include articles both on mysticism and on the calendrical documents that we've discussed in this episode. This text is really great because it goes well beyond a standard introduction to the Dead Sea Scrolls without being too enormously technical. Of course, if you really want to dive deep into the Dead Sea Scrolls themselves, you'll need to consult the various volumes of the discoveries in the Judean Desert. Most of the cryptic texts are gathered in Volume 36, while many of the calendrical documents can be found in Volume 16. If you're interested in ancient calendars, Sasha Stern's text Calendars in Antiquity is an excellent resource, though a little expensive. Of course, Stern also has a volume dedicated to just the calendrical issues in the Dead Sea Scrolls and in the history of Judaism. If you want an incredibly deep dive into issues of calendrics in the Dead Sea Scrolls, then Ben Dove's Head of All Years text is going to be for you. This text is well worth checking out, though I will say it is enormously technical. Until next time, I'm Dr. Justin Sledge, and you've been watching Esoterica, where we explore the arcane side of history, philosophy, and religion.